keep on studying this thing and, and uh, defending the faith, go to Jude, book of Jude. You may have this verse memorized by now. That's sort of my point in doing this over and over and over. Uh, also, if you would, keep in prayer uh, uh, the Kochakian family there in Massachusetts. Brother, uh, actually, Kim sent me a, a, a text picture of Steve passing out some tracks in New Hampshire when they're, when they're out doing something. And uh, so that was a real blessing. It's a blessing to see the work of God that was, some seeds that were planted here go on somewhere else. But keep them in prayer as they're still transitioning with housing and, and church and all that. Uh, Jude, verse number 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now, it says there to earnestly contend. That means to fight for something. And, and I will just ask you this before I, I go too far into this study today. Uh, how much of the fighting that went on in your life had anything to do for your faith this week? Think about that. I want to challenge you a little bit. All right? I would say for, for most, I, I would say for most of us, it might not be as much as we'd like it to be or as much as we think it would be. Uh, even when you say you're fighting for your faith, you've got to watch your motives in that thing. Sometimes you'll get in an argument even with your spouse and say, well, I'm standing up for God, and really what it is is you've got a point of view, and you want to push your point of view on somebody else, and you're going to try to use Scripture to do that, and you've got to be careful with that. Amen? Amen? So earnestly contend for the faith. That's what we're looking at doing, and part of that is knowing your weaponry. And, and the greatest weapon you have in that battle is this right here. And so my challenge to you and as, as we go through this is that you can learn on, on your own to defend what you believe and why you believe it. I have no problem. I enjoy when I get text messages and calls, hey, I had this situation come up. What do I say? What do I, I have no problem. I, I love it, man. That's what I'm here for. That's a blessing to me. But at the same time, I'll also tell you, as you continue to grow in the Lord, what the Lord wants to see from you, not so much just what I want to see, what God wants to see from you is that eventually you get to a place where people are calling you and texting you and asking you, hey, what do I, what do I say here, right? So, uh, again, that's what the point of this thing is. Now, uh, we have these outlines. I, may, I went ahead and printed a couple more just in case someone did not have them, theirs with them. Does everybody have their outline with them? You didn't bring yours? Okay. All right. This is a bad way to sort of tell on people. So who didn't have their outline today? <laughs> yeah. Just, just like there was a joke made before church that pastor was using... Uh, New Heights Baptist Church Facebook page is to spook, uh, to, what was it, to snoop, snoop on people. But I don't do that, everybody, okay, I really don't, I promise. Let me, let me, let me tell you why I don't, let me tell you why I don't. I've got enough problems with me. Amen. Why would in the world, I actually heard a pastor says, you know, you can see a bunch of, man, you're weird, why would you want to do that? I've got enough issues of my own and thus be spying on people and looking at their problems, man. Uh, that's strange to me, I think that kind of, uh. That kind of idea of pastoring is a little odd to me. But uh, anyways, I digress. Uh, go ahead and pull out your outlines. We're at point number nine. Point number nine in this thing, we're talking about defending the faith, and we're specifically talking about Jehovah's Witnesses and what they believe and how to defend uh, your faith in light of that. And again, uh, there's, there's sort of two reasons why we're looking at, it, at all these different groups, okay? Number one is to defend what you believe and contend for the faith. But number two is that you might be able to maybe win somebody to Jesus Christ. I can't tell you how many times I've come across somebody who said, well, I'm this religion, or I'm this denomination, or I'm that denomination, or I'm this. And really, ultimately, they were raised that way. They don't know why they believe what they believe, but it was what they were told. And if somebody would just show them from the Bible, they might get saved. Or, or maybe they are saved. They just need to be straightened out on their doctrine. Guys, can I say this? The, the part of you know in the Bible, the way the, the mantra of the... Uh, Fundamental Baptists from like the 1960s to really some of them still today is everything's about salvation. And that's not true. There are some people who are genuinely saved whose doctrines are just off. And they need to be in a Bible-leading church where they can grow in the Lord. And maybe you're the key to unlocking that. Maybe you can just show them in the Bible, hey, I, I understand where you're coming from, but let me show you what that actually says. All right? So uh, it's important that you have a, I don't know, a burden to reach people, Right? That it's not just about getting knowledge so I can say, look at what I know, or look at how right we are, and everybody else is wrong. Uh, that, that's definitely not the point. Look at Isaiah chapter 9, though. I want to show you something. Isaiah chapter 9. And I uh, want to point out to you, this is a, a very famous verse. How many of you have ever heard uh, the Hallelujah Chorus, Handel's Messiah? Okay. I remember when I was in Bible school, uh, I went to uh, Handel's Messiah. 
and uh, a bunch of first-year Bible students, and we got all dressed up, and man, we looked spiffy, and you know, most of us were single at the time, so we were thinking, maybe we'll find a good Christian girl like that. It's going to happen, you know? And so we go down there, and we're down there, and then all of a sudden, Brother Donovan walks in the bathroom. Now, you guys are going to be around to hear Brother Donovan preach in September. He walks in the bathroom, and he goes, what are you guys doing here? <laughs> and I said, he's from Connecticut, so he talks like this, you know? And I said, well, we, you know, we came, and he's like, well, you guys must have some class. I said, why are you here, <laughs> you know? Uh, but uh, I'll never forget that. When I was there, I heard these words sung. Look at verse number six. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called, remember this, Wonderful, remember that? Counselor, the mighty God, the ever... See, I, I like it. I get into that stuff. That's music to me. The everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now, let me ask you, who's that talking about? Jesus Christ. Okay. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Look at... Uh, hold, your, hold your hand there. Look at Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. And there's really no doubt about who this is. Uh, but what we're going to do is just make sure we understand who this is. And furthermore, uh, we're also going to define uh, something that they make. They make a di the uh, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses make a differentiation between the Almighty God, and they say that's Jehovah God, the Father, and the Mighty God, Jesus Christ. Now, uh, to me that sounds ridiculous, but we'll, we'll, I want to follow the train of thought, and I want to dissect it so we can... Really see what the Bible says, all right? Revelation chapter 12, and look, if you would, at, uh, let's see here, verse number 1. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and her head a crown of 12 stars. Let me help you out a little bit. We don't have time to compare all the scripture this morning, but that woman is Israel. She's clothed with the sun. Jesus Christ is called the sun of righteousness. Her glory is God. And the moon under her feet, that's the church. We are born out of Israel, guys. We're a, the Bible says in Romans chapter 11 that we are a wild olive tree, like a branch that was stuck into the real tree, and, and God allowed us to grow there, even though we're undeserving Gentile dogs. That's what the Bible says. All right? And so next time someone calls you a dog, say, woof, woof, amen. All right? Uh, all right? And it says, upon her head a crown of 12 stars, that's the 12 tribes of Israel. And she, Israel, being with child... She's, she's giving birth, Travailed, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, having set seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. Uh, uh, verse 4, and his tail drew the third parts of the, of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Remember Herod? What did Herod do as soon as baby Jesus was born? Let's kill all the infants uh, from infantile to two years. All the males, uh, babies from, from infant to two, let's kill them all, right? So, so here's some, some uh, Revelation 12 has some double application to it. It, re it refers partly to things that have ha happened already, the birth of Jesus, and partly to things that are still to come. Look at verse 5. And she brought forth a man-child who was, hasn't happened yet, to rule all nations with the rod of iron, and her child was what? Caught up, Acts chapter 1. After he resurrected from the dead, he goes back up and tells his apostles, his disciples, the same way you see me go up, I'll come back. All right? So this is, in fact, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, is a reference to Jesus Christ. Now the question is, is does the Bible make a differentiation between the Almighty God and the Mighty God? So if you got your outline there in point number 9, uh, and I'll make sure. Uh, Brother Elvin, do you have one of these? Okay, Brother Mark, would you grab this and hand it to him for me? Appreciate it. Thanks, sir. Uh, we're on number nine. That'll help you out a little bit. All right. Uh, so uh, there it says that they draw a distinction under number nine between the mighty God and the almighty God. However, I want to point out a few things, and I'll give you some scripture. All right. Uh, what they basically said is they, they basically teach it this way. Uh, Jesus is a mighty God. He has a lot of strength, but he's not the God. He's not the Almighty God. Therefore, as a result of that, there's a difference between the powers between these two people. All right? So, uh, biblically, is that accurate? No. All right, well, let's dissect that. Look at Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, and I want to show you some things that are attributed to Jesus Christ that can only be attributed to God. Hebrews chapter 1. 
Hebrews chapter 1, look at verse number 3. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. Who being the brightness, all right, now look, look back at verse 1. God, who at sundry times, that means various, uh, different times, and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Well, let me ask you a question. If Jesus is the one that made the worlds, and it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, then would that not make him God? Yes, it would. All right, look at verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory, God's glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, uh, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. All right, now it's very important. Look at verse number 8. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O what? God. He's calling the Son God, all right? Is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Now, guys, here's what you have to keep in mind. What's very interesting about this thing is this. Uh, the things that are just quoted there. By the way, what you just read in verse number 8, that's a quote from Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7, if you want to write that down. Verse 8, thy throne of God is forever, is forever and ever. That's a quote from Psalm 45, verse 6 and 7. That's a messianic psalm, talking about Jesus Christ coming back as the king, having the throne, etc., etc. But here's the point. David was a Jew, right? Did the Jews believe in multiple gods? No, they believed in one God. All right? The Lord thy God is one Lord. He is one God, all right? And, and as such, uh, uh, the Bible says that in light of that, in light of the fact that they believed in one God, if they were presenting two different gods, that would be exactly what the Jews accused Jesus Christ of doing, blasphemy. And it's not two gods. It's one. What the Jews could not understand is that God, the Bible calls it the mystery of Godliness, could become man and present himself as a man. They couldn't understand that. But it wasn't two gods. All right? Let me give you another one. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28. Matthew 28. Now this one is one that uh, I think points to something during the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. Matthew 28. Look at verse 18. And, or let me look at, look at uh, verse 17, I'm sorry. And when they saw him, they what? Now guys, can I, can I tell you something? Every time that somebody bows before an angel in the Bible, you know what they always do? Get up. Don't worship me. You know, uh, when, uh, if Peter was the first pope, he would have made an awful pope, because when people bowed down to him, you know what he says there in Acts 10? Get up, for I am also a man, as you are, right? So worship and adoration and bowing and the humbling of one before another, that thing of worship is directed solely to God in the Bible, right? So here, the, the, the apostles, they worship Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question. If they were wrong for worshiping Him as God, and He was not the God of the Old Testament, don't you think for a second that Jesus Christ, if He was who He said He was, the messenger of Jehovah God, don't you think He would have said, hey, listen, don't, don't worship me. I'm just a man. Get up. He didn't do that. They kept worshiping. They, he didn't stop them. Why? Because he's God. All right? Look at uh, verse 18. Jesus came and spake to them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. All power. That sounds like almighty to me. Right? Uh, I don't think you can really stress that in any other way. All power is given unto me. All right? So, uh, but let's, let's go ahead for sake of argument. Let's just say that... that uh, Let's just say that there was this idea of a distinction. I think the Bible, even in their own version of it, shows us that, 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 that Jesus Christ is not just uh, another God. Let, let's look at something. Look at Isaiah chapter 10. Isaiah chapter 10. Isaiah chapter 10 and verse number 20. Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 20. And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob shall no more again stay upon him that smote them, but shall stay upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. The remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto who? Now, you know what even, it says the same thing in their Bible. Now, let me ask you a question. 
if they say in the context, and they would, if you look at the context of this thing, verse 17, the light of Israel shall be for a fire, and his holy one, capital H, capital O, for a flame, they would tell you, oh yeah, that's Jehovah God. Well then, who are they returning to? <laughs> They're returning to Jehovah God, but it's a reference to Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's God, manifest in the flesh. All right, look at another one. Look at Jeremiah chapter 32, Jeremiah 32. And what I'll do is I'll read, uh, I'll read it in our Bible, then I'll go ahead and quote to you how it reads in the New World Translation as well. Jeremiah 32. Jeremiah 32, my, my goal today is to get through these Old Testament verses, and the next time that we get together to uh, uh, look at some New Testament verses. And I think that if you can get the Old Testament stuff the, as a foundation, the New Testament sort of explains a lot of itself as well. But look at Jeremiah 32, look at verse number uh, 18. Thou showest loving kindness unto thousands, and recompensest the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. The great, the mighty God, comma, look at this, the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. You know what it does? It makes the mighty God and Jehovah God as they try to make a difference between the two, makes them the same person. Why? Because they are. <laughs> they are. Jesus Christ is God. And let me, let me read this to you. All right, look what it says here. The true God, the great one, the mighty one. This is in their own translation. Jehovah of armies being his name. Now, obviously, that's a, that's a, that's a poor translation, but here's the point. The point is this. The point is, even in their own Bible, the mighty God and Jehovah God are the same person, and yet they try to make them different. <laughs> so it's, very, it's, it's a very interesting thing. Now look at uh, John chapter 20 real quickly. John chapter 20. Just to further, uh, I guess, uh, make this point. It's very interesting when you start to learn about what other groups uh, believe, and then you look at their own writings, and you find that even in their own writings there's a lot of these loopholes. Uh, John chapter 20. And I want to show you, look at verse number 26. And after eight days, again, his disciples were within, and Thomas was with them. Remember that the first time Jesus showed up to the disciples, Thomas wasn't there. Remember that? Unless I feel him, and I, you know, put my fist into his side, and all that kind of stuff. This time, Thomas is there. All right? Uh, look at uh, verse 26. After eight days, again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, reach hither, reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, what? My Lord and my God. Now, Jesus goes on to talk to him, but he doesn't rebuke him for saying that. If he wasn't God, and if he wasn't the mighty God, if he wasn't the almighty God, Jesus would have stopped him right then and there. He didn't. He fell down and worshiped before him. All right, so again, uh, there's some other verses we could look at. Look at Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. The point is this, and I know that you may almost be tired of hearing it at this point, but Jesus Christ is God. Amen? <laughs> and, uh, and guys, really, your salvation, if you really break it down, it rests on the fact that Jesus Christ is God. Because no sinner, no no. No mortal man, if he was just a man, could make a perfect sacrifice for your sins. Couldn't be done. All right? Uh, Revelation chapter 1, look at verse number 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds. This is a reference to Jesus Christ. And every eye shall see him. That's the second coming, not the rapture. Because in the rapture, not every eye does see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, Amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. Look at this, saith the Lord, which is and which was, which is to come, the what? The Almighty. The Almighty. All right, so there you go. Jesus Christ is the Almighty God. <laughs> All right, and so that distinction that they try to make, it's almost, here's almost how I look at this, guys. Here's how I see this thing. I see this thing as them saying, well, he's not God. He's a lesser God. He's a created God. And then they go on and go, okay, 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 fine. He's God. But he's not the, 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 the God, right? He's, he's the mighty God, not the almighty God. And then you get through all these verses, and it's okay, fine. He's almighty God. What do you want me to say? You know I mean? That's sort of how I see this train of thought going is initially he's not God. 
He's a, he's a messenger of God. He's a lesser God, a, a created God. And then you go through all the scripture and go, okay, fine. It's almost like in their own Bible, in their own thinking, their own thought process through this, they realize there's no way that we can rid ourselves of the fact that he's God. So we've got to make a difference where there is none. <laughs> We're going to say he's the mighty God and Jehovah God's the almighty God. And uh, obviously, biblically, it just doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work. All right, look at Isaiah chapter 43. Any questions on that point? Any questions on that point? Also, one thing I really haven't done too much of is, is taking questions as we go through this, and I probably should. So uh, at the end of each, of, of each point, I'll ask if you have any questions, so write them down as we're going. Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah 43. All right, Isaiah 43. And this is a big one. This is a real big one for them. Uh, this is in part where you, you get the term Jehovah's Witnesses, at least in their mind. Uh, look at Isaiah 43, look at verse 10. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord. All right, and their Bible would say, Ye are my witnesses, says Jehovah. You are my witnesses, says Jehovah. And my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. There's that I am again. All right, that's important. If you start from Exodus chapter 3 where that I am first shows up and you run all through the Bible, it's connected with God. And Jesus Christ, all through the book of John, let me point this out to you as well. Uh, the different Gospels present Jesus Christ in a different light. Matthew presents him as a king. Mark, and we've gone through this before, presents him as a servant. Luke presents him as what? Anybody know? Man, all right? That's why you'll find the phrase all through the Gospels, when Jesus talks of himself, he calls himself the Son of Man. And the reason for that is, he also calls himself the Son of God, but I'll, I'll point out to you why that Son of Man is also as important, is he's trying to show them, if you, if you trace that thing, that saying in the Old Testament was oftentimes a reference to prophets. Uh, they were oftentimes called Son of Man. And the reason for that is God was, was bringing a message to his people, and he was reminding the prophet himself, hey, listen, I know who you are. <laughs> You're a Son of Man. You're just a man but I still have a divine message for you to take to those people. All right? So Jesus Christ refers to himself as Son of Man because he's saying, hey, listen, I, physically I'm one of you. I've experienced what you've experienced. All right? But then John presents him as what? As God. You'll find more references to the phrase Son of God in the Gospel of John than any other Gospel in the New Testament. All right? It presents him as God. So you know what you find in the book of John all through there? I am. I am the door. I am the shepherd. I am the keeper of the sheep. I am the, 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 uh, the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life, right? I am the light of the world, right? All right? That, that I am that's constantly emphasized in the Gospel of John, that's why. Because it's presenting him as God. All right? So here in Isaiah 43 and verse 10, he says, And understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. So you would think that verse in and of itself would sort of contradict the idea that Jesus Christ was a begotten or created God. All right? uh, but let's just go ahead and, and, and focus on the first part of that verse. Ye are my witnesses. Ye are my witnesses. So, so the, the whole catch here is this. They use that verse in large part to talk about their group being the exclusive group called Jehovah's Witnesses. All right? Let me take you to Revelation chapter 14. And I want to point out two main things here. All right. Uh, first off, I, I want to say this. In large part, this is a national thing that's going on. He's talking to the nation of Israel. As you turn to Revelation 14, I'll read to you Isaiah 43 and verse 1. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, that's Israel, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. Okay? The, the point is this, when God brings that message in Isaiah 43, it's not just thrown out to some random group who wants to take it and run with it and say, okay, that's us. That's a reference to a nation, and it's Israel. All right? And so look at Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14, again, rightly dividing the Bible and the different groups of people in the Bible. It's very important. Revelation 14, uh, and uh, look, if you would, at verse number 1. All right, and I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion. This is heavenly Mount Zion, not the physical one in Jerusalem. There's two, by the way. That's another Bible study. And with him, an hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. 
Now, you know during the tribulation that the majority of the world is going to get a mark put where? On their hand or right here, right? So you have these witnesses who go out and they preach during the tribulation. And we're going to see who these people actually are, okay? But there's 144,000 of them. All right, look what it says here. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand, which were redeemed from the earth. Let's see who the, these people actually are. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. All right, first off, they're men. All right, first thing. So when a lady knocks on your door and she tells you she's a Jehovah's Witness, right there you know something's wrong, right? All right, that's the first thing they're men. All right, they're virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. All right, these were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Now there's 144,000 of them, 12,000 from each tribe of Israel. All right, and uh, he, here's, the, here's the point. Guys, this is a, a group of people that aren't, their ministry hasn't started yet. It's coming. It's coming. During the tribulation, they will be preaching, and they will be going out and preaching truth. All right? And what's happening in this story, if you read in, in, in this uh, passage of Scripture, uh, it says that they are, look if you would at, uh, let's see here, verse 5, In their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Look at verse number 7. Or, I'm sorry, not verse 7. Uh, let's see here. Uh, to, to, to verse 12, here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. All right, look at verse number 14. I looked, and behold, a white cloud upon the cloud. One sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and his hand a sharp sickle. All right, and un another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle and the earth... Uh, on the earth, and the earth was reaped, all right? And, uh, and so what you have here in this thing is you've got a, a, a reference to the, the Great Tribulation. During this time, you have 144,000 male Jewish virgins going out and preaching truth to people on the earth. And what happens to them is that they're killed for that, <laughs> all right? And they are there before the throne of God up in heaven singing and praising praises to God, and that's what we're reading about in Revelation 14. The point is this, anybody who tries to tell you that in the year 2013, as an American, not a Jew, but a Gentile, you know, that they are one of Jehovah's Witnesses or they are part of a group that is that, when this has not happened yet, there's, there's something wrong in their theology, okay? There's something wrong with their interpretation of prophecy. And so that's the first thing, that's the first thing, all right? Because there's this real emphasis on, in their group on, well, we're not just Christians, we're Jehovah's Witnesses. And so, you know, that makes us, you know, really, you know, close to God. And we, we're the ones that really have the truth, the ones that really have the message, and so on and so forth. Because we're witnesses, as the Bible says in Isaiah 43 of Jehovah. Now, guys, let me say this. When you open your mouth for Jesus Christ, you're a Jehovah's Witness. Amen? Because you're preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's the truth that God wants you to preach. So everyone that's a, that's a bible and Christian is a Jehovah's Witness, but not necessarily in the way that they mean it, Okay? Now, uh, l let me say this. Uh, look at Acts chapter 1. Go there real quick. All right, Acts chapter 1. Because it's not just a matter of being Jehovah's Witness, but, you know, if you want to get real straining at a gnat, real technical about it, as they do with that thing, look at Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Look at verse 7. And uh, this is the disciples there asking in verse 6 about whether the Lord was going to restore the kingdom of Israel at the time. And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be what? Unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, and under the uttermost parts of, part, part of the earth. That's what we are still commanded to do. We are commanded to go out and be a witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. It's not just, listen guys, if, if they get real you know, stuck on this Jehovah thing, then take them to Acts chapter 1. Hey, I'm commanded to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ and His gospel wherever I go. Amen? 
And it's not just a matter of being Jehovah's Witness and this is something special. Listen, if you're following the New Testament Christian uh, 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 standard, if you will, in the book of Acts, you're a witness for Jesus Christ. All right? And I want to point something else out. Look at Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. A disciple of Jesus Christ is given a name in the Bible. All right? So in your outline, uh, under point number 10, you want to put uh, under that first sub-point, see Revelation chapter 14. The other is that Jesus says in Acts chapter 1, 7, and 8 that we should be witnesses for him. And it says in Acts chapter 11, look if you would at Acts chapter 11, and look at uh, verse number, oh, I think I may have gotten the wrong verse. Let's see here. Uh, I did. I got the wrong verse, but I'm in the right chapter. Verse uh, 26. When he had found him, that's Barnabas finding Paul. When he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called what? Christians, Christians in Antioch. They weren't called Jehovah's Witnesses. Now I don't, I don't get a, I don't get real big and technical on it. They are. <laughs> I mean, if you want to call yourself Jehovah's Witness, fine. But, but they get real technical about it, and they call themselves that. And to them, that means something totally different than what you should take it to mean, right? All right? So my whole thing is this. If someone were to get very uh, stuck on the idea of being Jehovah's Witness and not a witness for Jesus Christ, I'd just take them to church and go, hey, what do you do with that? I'm called to be his witness. And furthermore, the name that's given to me in the Bible, all right, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, and it, it gives historical account of what they call the disciples, they're called Christians, not Jehovah's Witnesses. All right, so that's what you ought to be. You ought to be a Bible-believing Christian. We say, well, aren't we Baptists? Yes, but even before you align yourself with Baptists, all right, you need to be a Bible-believing Christian, and here's why. Because where the, where the Baptists may go off where the Bible, uh, on an area where the Bible is sound, what are you, a Baptist or a Bible-believing Christian? I take that first. Right. Not that I, I'm not a Baptist. Guys, we are New Heights Baptist Church. But I'll tell you right now, historically, Baptists haven't been perfect on everything. They haven't. So you know what I do? Whenever the Baptist, the main Baptist teaching crosses the Bible, I go with the Bible. So I'm a Bible-believing Christian. Yes, I'm an independent, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptist. That's what I am. But first, I'm a Christian. All right? And, and that's very important. Let me give you an example of that. Many Baptists have preached and taught for years that salvation in the Old Testament is exactly the same as it is in the New Testament. Eh, wrong. You can't. How? Because the death, without the death of the testator, there can be no testament. You're still in the Old Testament, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 16, until Christ dies. Let me ask you a question. If that was the case, when if a rich man were to come to you and say, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? What would you tell him? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. If, if a lost person comes to you and says, listen, I, I want in on the kingdom of God, you would tell them, hey, Trust Jesus Christ, right? When, isn't that what you ought to say? What did Jesus Christ tell that rich man? That sounds a little bit like works. <gasps> Pastor Adrian believes we get saved. Oh, I didn't say that. I didn't say we got saved by works. What I'm saying is their salvation was different than ours. We go directly to heaven, don't we? They went to Abraham's bosom. Why? The blood hadn't been shed yet. That's why every year another lamb had to be killed for the sin offering of the people. And next year another lamb had to be killed. But when he came, behold, Lamb of God that taketh away, not just atones or covers it, takes it away. You see what I'm getting at, guys? Is when, whenever we have a difference of, uh, of doctrine where maybe traditionally Baptists are over here and the Bible is here, I'm going here. Why? Because I'm a bible being Christian first, right? Uh, let, me, let, me give you, let me put it to you real close to home, okay? Okay. Uh, Oh, how do I say this without it sounding wrong? Um, a lot of people have this idea that to be a pastor or to be a minister, you have to be sort of soft and almost borderline effeminate. Can I say this? I was a man, God made me a man, before I was called to preach. Okay? God did not necessarily want me to change that to fulfill my calling. Okay? And so as such, you're a Bible-believing Christian first. 
and where maybe Baptists go off, and it's important that you get a hold of that. I'm not, guys, I'm a Baptist through and through. I believe it. I would, I'd love to teach you church history about the Baptists, uh, those who follow the Baptist faith. I'd love to go through all that, and sometime we probably will. I did that in Tennessee for a, a Sunday school class once, and that was a lot of fun. But ultimately, I want you to know your identity should be found in Jesus Christ, not a church. Not even New Heights Baptist Church. Your identity, first and foremost, as a child of God, is in Him. Then, as it relates to your local church, yeah, you identify with New Heights Baptist Church. But it's important you understand the order of that. All right? They get hung up on this. The Bible tells us we're Christians. Okay? All right, let me get into this last one, and I'm going to run through it as quickly as I can. Ezekiel chapter 18. Go to Ezekiel 18. Ezekiel 18. Ezekiel 18, and look, if you would, at verse number 4. Ezekiel 18, look at verse number 4. And uh, the Bible says, Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Now, one of the greatest, one of the greatest verses, in my opinion, about showing the difference between Old Testament, if you will, the Old Testament covenant and the New Testament covenant through Jesus Christ is this passage right here. All right? And so Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 4, it says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Now, I've got to keep you in mind the fact, and again, you guys might get tired of hearing it, but it's very important, and, and I go through some of these things over and over and over for a reason. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21, I believe it is, uh, I pray your whole uh, soul, uh, body, uh, soul, body, and spirit uh, be sanctified in Jesus Christ and His coming. And I'm killing that verse, and I apologize for that. But here's what it says. It refers to you as being a soul, a body, and a spirit, right? Okay, so what you do is you understand as a New Testament Christian, look at Colossians chapter 2. Let me show you something. Colossians chapter 2. Do you ever think about why there's such an emphasis in the Old Testament about not touching certain things that were dead and defiled? And there's such an emphasis on the physical, more so in the Old Testament than there is in the New Testament. Now, I'm not saying the physical is not important in the New Testament. I'm actually going to preach a little bit on that this morning. But the physical, as it relates to a believer, does not affect your eternity, does not affect your soul's eternal destination. Does that make sense? For an Old Testament saint, it could have. It could have. Let me give another example. Let me just throw out this thought. Can you lose the Holy Spirit when you grieve Him? No. At least hope you can, right? <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4 says you're sealed under the day of redemption. You're sealed, right? Okay, what about Saul? When he transgressed and vexed the Spirit of God, what does the Bible say? It left him. The Spirit of God left him, and an evil spirit came and troubled him. Okay? So we see there's some differences here. Look at... Uh, what did I say to go? Colossians. Colossians, sorry. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. I'm glad someone is paying attention because I wasn't. <laughs> Colossians chapter 2. And uh, Colossians chapter 2, apparently what we're going to do is we'll get through this one. And in the last one, there's quite a bit of material to go into. So we'll finish that and get into New Testament verses next week. Colossians chapter 2. Look, if you would, at verse number 11. In whom also ye are circumcised. Now, guys, I don't think we have to go into a biology, you know, uh, a biology class here, or anatomy class. Circumcision in the Old Testament was a physical thing, and it was only for men. Okay, we'll leave it there. All right, but this is not just written to men. This is written to all saved people. In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision. Look at this. Made without hands. It's not a physical one. It's a spiritual one. In putting off the what? Body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, and you being dead in your sins, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, that's, the, that's before you were saved, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. All right, so here is the point. The point is simply this. There's this thing in the New Testament called a spiritual circumcision. It's also called the operation of God. All right, made without hands. And so what, what happened when you got saved? The Bible says that no longer would these two be connected. All right? Now think about this. 
The body and the soul are very, very similar in, in the sense that they have the senses in common. All right? The rich man lifted up his eyes in hell, being in torments, and said to Abraham, Send Lazarus, he may dip his finger in water and cool my tongue. Is that a physical body there? No. If that was a physical body, it would have been burned up and consumed. It's, a spirit. it's his soul there. All right? So in the Old Testament, the body and the soul, you know what they were? They were, they were together. And so when you touch something unclean, guess what? Your soul was unclean. When you did something that was sinful, guess what? Your soul had sinned. And if a man did not bring the sacrifice for those sins, and a man did not repent of those sins and bring a sacrifice for them, as far as the Bible goes, man, he could have been, in a sense, as we would look at it today, lost. He could have gone out into eternity without the hope of, of being in paradise. Thank God for New Testament salvation. Right? All right? But here's the point. In Ezekiel chapter 18, that is not a, a commentary on your soul dying and being unconscious in the soul sleep. All right? That's a reference to the fact that in the Old Testament when a man sinned, he was in a place of jeopardy, spiritually speaking, as far as his eternal soul went. For you as a believer, guess what? Thank God... These two are no longer connected, right? Your spirit has been, John chapter 3, born again, all right? Your soul has been redeemed, and your body is awaiting that redemption. Romans chapter 8, that's a reference to the rapture when you get a new body, all right? Now, the Bible says that the body, the, the flesh, and the spirit, they, they struggle against each other, they war against each other, all right? We understand there's a struggle here. But to be biblically accurate and to be sound in doctrine, we understand that this is no longer affected by this when it comes to your eternity. Thank God for that. All right? It talks about putting off the filthiness of the flesh, not the soul in the New Testament, because that's already been taken care of once you're saved. Your sins have been washed away. As far as God is concerned, you know what he sees on your soul? He sees the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's a blessing. That's a blessing. But in the Old Testament, it was different. So when they try to go to Ezekiel chapter 18, here's the point, guys. The point is this. Uh, Revelation chapter 6, uh, go there real quickly. The point is this. Uh, when you find someone going to the Old Testament to try to define matters of eternity for a New Testament Christian, when we're told very clearly we're under a new covenant, and we're able to see very clearly from Scripture there's a lot of differences, something is wrong. All right. Revelation chapter 6, look at verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice. According to them, the soul that sins just sort of is in limbo, just sort of lies in the grave. Nothing happens. All right? According to this, that's not the case. Souls are singing. Amen? That's why when you come in on Sunday, even when your body doesn't feel like it, sing. Amen? Because your soul wants to. All right? Uh, how long, O oh Lord, how holy and true dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Look at this. Look at verse 11. And white robes were given unto every one of them. The soul has sort of a, a bodily type of shape, but it's not your physical body. Because they left their physical body on the earth, but they're up there in heaven singing unto him and praising him, and they have white robes. So, uh, again, the point is this. Uh, your soul doesn't just go to a place of limbo. All right? You're either saved, and when you're saved, your, your body goes to the grave or wherever it goes, and then your soul goes up to God to be asked for the body to be present with the Lord, right? But if you're lost, quite the opposite. However, that whole Ezekiel 18, the soul that sinneth it shall die, that's a great passage to show somebody the difference between the Old Testament and New Testament salvation. Old Testament New Testament covenant, if you want to use that word, okay? Because uh, I would challenge someone that says, well, I believe this is true for today. Well, have you sinned? Yeah. Okay. So either you're dying and going to hell, and you're admitting that, or you're dead right now. One of the two. <laughs> and either one of them is true, because they're not going to want to admit that they're dying. They're, no, no, no. I, I've sinned, but not that bad. That's what most people do. Okay. The point is, it doesn't elaborate in Ezekiel 18. It just says, the soul that sinneth it shall die. Right? So a uh, difference, Old Testament to New Testament. Okay. We'll go ahead and stop there. We went over time. Uh, we'll hit uh, point 12 next time, then we'll get into New Testament verses as well. All right. Brother Joel, if you would, dismiss us in a word of prayer.